May 21, 2024, started as a quiet spring day in southwest Iowa. After an early morning line of severe storms, the sky was mostly clear with winds coming from the south-southeast at nearly 40 miles per hour. Surface temperatures quickly rose into the upper 70s, with dew points reaching the upper 60s. Although it seemed like a warm, humid, and calm spring day to most, meteorologists around the U.S. were beginning to be more and more concerned about a major severe weather event unfolding. Within hours, five people would be killed, 35 people would be injured, and hundreds of homes and lives would be overturned forever. In the days leading up to May 21st, across the Midwest, the atmosphere was priming itself for chaos. A powerful low-pressure system was barreling out of the Rockies, dragging a strong, warm front with it. Temperatures in Iowa soared into the 70s, with dew points climbing into the upper 60s. According to meteorologist Jeff Habe, as a general rule, the surface dew points seem to be at least 55 degrees or higher for surface-based thunderstorms to occur. As the surface dew points and temperatures continued to climb, the atmosphere began to destabilize rapidly due to extensive clear skies across the region. Cape values exploded to values of 25 to 3500 joules per kilogram. CAPE, or Convective Available Potential Energy, is a measurement of the instability of the atmosphere which leads to explosive thunderstorm development. Overhead, the jet stream was screaming, delivering both ample forcing to create storms and wind shear to cause storms to rotate and produce significant long-track tornadoes. Similarly, powerful wind fields producing elongated hodographs are expected to be present in the region throughout the early afternoon. Elongated hodographs are a measure indicative of a shift in wind speed with height that allows for the development of rotating thunderstorms. The storm mode was initially expected to be discrete, with fast-moving individual storms staying ahead of the cold front in the severe, conducive warm sector. These storms are expected to quickly develop the characteristics of severe supercell thunderstorms, with strong wind gusts up to 75 miles per hour, very large hail up to 3 inches, and strong, long-track tornadoes all being possible. By the morning of the 21st, the Storm Prediction Center had issued a rare, moderate-risk outlook for southwest Iowa with a note of significant tornadoes. They knew something big was coming, and they weren't wrong. By 1.10 p.m. Central Time, the SBC in Oklahoma had issued a rare PDS, or Particularly Dangerous Situation, tornado watch for much of Iowa and the surrounding states. In weather forecasting, Particularly Dangerous Situation, or PDS, is the wording used by the National Weather Service to convey special urgency in watch or warning messages for unusually extreme and life-threatening severe weather. PDS watches and warnings are uncommon. From 1996 to 2005, the SBC issued an average of 24 per year, less than 3% of all watches. By early afternoon, the first storms ignited ahead of the cold front in western Iowa. These storms tended to be semi-discrete, meaning they portrayed characteristics of both isolated and linear storms. Storm mode is important to note due to tornadic potential. The more discrete storms can stay, the better the chance for stronger, long-track tornadoes. By 2 p.m., the National Weather Service in Des Moines was already issuing tornado warnings. One of these storms southwest of Greenfield was about to take center stage. At 2.57 p.m., a funnel dropped from the sky at the intersection of 110th Street and Vine Avenue in rural Page County, Iowa. EF1 damage was reported at this very early stage of the tornado due to a barn's roof being torn clean off. As the tornado began to near Highway 34, numerous chasers, including myself, captured the tornado as it began intensifying. Unfortunately, as the tornado crossed Iowa 148, the first death was reported. 41-year-old Monica Irma Zamarone was tragically ejected from her vehicle after being caught in the intense tornado circulation. At first, many news organizations called Zamarone's death a chaser death for clicks and engagement bait. Her family quickly denounced these claims. By this point, the tornado was already approximately 1,300 yards wide, displaying a powerful, multi-vortex appearance. While the tornado continued trekking through northeastern Adams County, it took down numerous wind turbines. 
According to National Weather Service surveys, it took EF2 level 117 mile per hour winds to destroy a wind turbine. As the tornado began crossing into Adair County, it continued to strengthen. Numerous outbuildings and barns were destroyed, causing EF1 level damage. As the tornado crossed 290th Street northeast of Gilead, it caused its first instances of EF4 damage, two well-constructed homes under a mile apart. As the tornado edged closer and closer to Greenfield, it caused multiple instances of EF3 and EF4 damage. It initially appeared as though the storm may miss Greenfield to the northwest. However, as the tornado got closer and closer to Greenfield, it took a sharp turn towards the heart of southeastern Greenfield. As the tornado then entered the southwest side of Greenfield, it began producing EF4 damage once again, reaching its peak intensity of mid-range EF4 shortly after entering the town. Dozens of homes were leveled, with some homes being partially swept away. Mobile homes and outbuildings were completely obliterated. The most intense damage occurred when a well-built home was obliterated and swept away. They estimated the wind speed at this location to be 185 miles per hour. The Adair County Hospital suffered significant damage with lab and testing equipment being destroyed and hallways being flooded. Catherine Hillestad, CEO of the hospital, stated that, had the tornado been any closer to our hospital or hit us directly, this entire building would be gone. Finally, as the tornado exited Greenfield to the northeast, the main supercell cycled and cut off the mesocyclone from fueling the tornado any longer. In all, the tornado tracked 42.38 miles in around 48 minutes, with an estimated peak wind speed reaching 185 miles per hour, or mid to upper level EF4 strength. The southeastern side of Greenfield was completely destroyed by the tornado, with some news outlets reporting over 150 homes being significantly damaged beyond repair. Due to the extreme forward motion of nearly 45 miles per hour of the tornado, all it took was one minute for the entirety of Greenfield to be changed forever. In the days after the tornado, National Weather Service Des Moines got to work surveying the damage. Survey teams confirmed the EF4 rating with peak winds at 185 miles per hour, just shy of EF5 territory. The path was littered with damage. Cars hurled hundreds of yards, foundations scoured clean. A research team headed by Josh Werman and Karen Kosiba of the Flexible Array of Radars and Masonets research team observed the Greenfield tornado at close range with numerous radar wind measurement devices. The team measured a very brief wind gust of 263 to 271 miles per hour at a height of 144 feet, which translates to an instantaneous gust of 309 to 318 miles per hour when adjusted to ground level estimation. This extreme wind speed was experienced for less than a second and has been described as one of the highest wind speeds ever measured on Earth. This is one of only three observations of wind speeds exceeding 300 miles per hour inside of a tornado, alongside the 1999 Bridge Creek Moore tornado and the 2013 El Reno, Oklahoma tornado. Although close range radar data disagreed with the National Weather Service's EF4 damage estimates, the EF scale does not consider radar data. According to Bill Gallus, a professor of meteorology at Iowa State University, wind measurements are collected on very few tornadoes and therefore are too inconsistently taken to be included in the final rating. So, the EF4 rating was maintained. However, even with significant discrepancies between radar measured wind speeds and damage estimated wind speeds, Jimmy Schultz, the mayor of Greenfield, stated that the wind estimates and damage surveys ignored the reality that numerous people experienced major personal loss due to the tornado. No matter what wind speed and all of the other stuff, it was a vicious tornado that came through here and a lot of people lost everything. You know, I mean, a few lost their lives, but most of them lost everything. In the days, weeks, and months after the tornado, the support for the small community of Greenfield was immense. Ryan Hall's Y'all Squad raised $93,000 in recovery funds for the town. Later that summer, the annual Ragbri Bicycle Tour reached fifty dollars to $60,000. The Greater Greenfield Community Foundation raised nearly $1 million in six months following the tornado. And still, even with all the recovery progress, to this day, the impacts from the tornado remain evident in the community. One of the bizarre impacts still present includes corn astonishingly growing from various random street corners in the town due to the tornado picking crops and placing them into the town. Fortunately, by November 2024, it was confirmed that at least 51 of the around 150 buildings that were completely destroyed by the tornado had received building permits. This number is likely much, much higher now. 
Although the small community of Greenfield will remember the 2024 EF4 forever, the community did not allow the tragedy to bring them down and has come back stronger than ever. Thank you all so much for watching. It took me a very long time to write, edit, um, and everything required to make this video, so it would really help me out if you used like and subscribe. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for tuning in. I'd also like to give a special shout out to these people. Uh, they all contribute in different ways, uh, but I really appreciate everybody for watching this video. Um, if you made it this far, like I said, don't forget to like and subscribe, but I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye. Uh -huh.